This is an excellent example of a weld failure in a pipe flange that was reported by Hydro Inc., a company that makes pumps. The question is, can we come up with a rational approach to estimating the fatigue lifetime of weldments? So the first thing we always have to do is characterize cyclic loads. Now, since we are talking about welds, we are going to be using a shear stress amplitude and a shear mean stress because shear is the way we describe weld failure. We're going to have to adjust all of our thinking about fatigue and recast it in terms of shear stresses. The other thing that we're going to need to do is implement stress concentration factors. And Table 9.5 in the Shigley book provides us fatigue stress concentration factors, so we don't have to worry about notch sensitivity. And it's probably a good idea, if you're going to be conservative, to use the 2.7 value for the fatigue stress concentration factor. That will just give us a conservative answer. So the way we're going to do this is we will evaluate a simple problem. 1018 hot rolled steel bar, 2 inches wide, one half inch thick, welded through two three eighths inch fillet welds using an E6010 weldment to a 1018 hot rolled back plate. We are going to apply a cyclic load that varies from zero to 1,000 pounds to this plate. The load amplitude is going to be 500 pounds and the load mean is also going to be 500 pounds. And so we're going to convert those loads into stresses associated with the weldment. And then we're going to try to cast that into in terms of a fatigue factor of safety for infinite life. Our goal is to find a fatigue factor of safety for infinite life. Now we are going to be faced with dealing with finding a fully corrected endurance limit so that we can then calculate a factor of safety. You may recall that the endurance limit has all of these Marin factor modifications that we apply to our first estimate of the endurance strength, where that first estimate is half the ultimate strength. And then we correct things from there. So first off, what we're going to do is evaluate the surface modification factor using the ultimate strength of the material. And we are always going to do this in terms of the as-forged condition. So that means that that our Ka is going to be equal to 39.9 times our ultimate tensile strength raised to the minus 0 0.995 power. And so we're going to need the ultimate tensile strength from table A20 for the 1018 hot roll. We have an ultimate tensile strength of 58 kpsi and a yield strength of 32 kpsi. For the E6010 electrode, we have an ultimate tensile strength of 62 kpsi and a yield strength of 50 kpsi. Now, what we're going to end up doing, though, cast our fatigue problem in terms of the weaker material. And so we're going to end up using the base metal for all of our fatigue calculations, but we're still going to use throat areas and the like in order to do these calculations. So we're going to go back to this endurance limit estimation that's given by equation 618 in the Shigley book, and we're going to end up using the ultimate strength of the 1018, 58 kpsi. And so our first estimate of the endurance strength, SC prime, is going to be half of that, 29 kpsi. PSI. So there's my SE prime. Now I'm going to calculate the Ka, 39.9 times 58 kpsi raised to the minus 0 0.995 power. That gives me a Ka of 0 0.702. So I have my Ka, the geometric size modification factor. When we load in tension, Kb is equal to 1. And that's what we're doing in this particular example. We are taking a strip of material and we are loading it in repeated tensile loading, so our Kb is equal to 1. Our Kc is our load modification factor, so are we loading it in rotating bending? No, we're loading this in shear because we're going to be looking at the shear stresses at the weldment location. So in that case, our Kc is equal to 0 0.59. At this point in time, I'm not going to worry about any of the other modification factors, so I'm just going to let all the rest of them be equal to 1. 
And so this means that our endurance strength estimate is going to be Ka times Kb times Kc times our 29 kpsi initial endurance strength estimate. Well, if we calculate the Ka, we found it to be 0.702. Kb, the geometric size effect, is 1 for tensile loading. The loading type is shear, so we use 0.59, multiply that by 29 kpsi, and that gives me an endurance strength estimate of 12 kpsi. We're going to need that in a short bit. Now what we have to do is figure out what the heck my stress amplitude and my mean stress happen to be. So I know that they're both equal to each other, and I know that there is going to be a direct shear on the weldment. I'm just applying tensile load, so this becomes a slightly easier problem. That means I have to look up the A for this particular weld group. So we have to find what the cross-sectional area is for our particular weld group, and we go to the table in the textbook, and the weld group is number two, and our area is 1.414 HD. A is 1.414 HD. Our H is three-eighths of an inch, and our D is two inches. And so our TA, which is equal to our TM, is just going to be our load, 500 pounds, divided by 1.414 times 3 a of an inch times 2 inches. And that gives me a stress amplitude and a mean stress of 471 pound per square inch. So our stress amplitude and our mean stresses are the same, but now we're going to multiply those by a fatigue stress concentration factor. Kfs tau A is equal to Kfs tau M, which is equal to 2.7 times 471 pound per square inch, which gives me 1.27 kilopounds per square inch. Stress amplitude and my mean stress, and we're going to end up using those in a fatigue calculation. So what is our fatigue calculation going to be? I'm going to use a Goodman equation, and that says that my stress amplitude divided by my endurance limit plus my mean stress divided by my ultimate is equal to 1 over nf. Now I have cast my stress amplitudes as shear stress amplitudes and shear mean stresses, and I said they're both equal to 1.27 kpsi. I have already found my endurance strength for shear loading, so my shear endurance strength is going to be equal to 12 kpsi, and now I need my shear ultimate, and that's going to be different from my tensile ultimate, and it turns out that the shear ultimate is about 67% of my tensile ultimate, and I'm going to use the ultimate tensile strength of the base metal, and so my shear ultimate tensile strength is 38.86 kpsi. Now I have everything I need. I'm going to put my shear stresses into the Goodman equation. I'm going to use my shear stress ultimate and my corrected endurance strength, so I get 1.27, that is my shear stress amplitude, divided by 12, plus my mean stress, 1.27, these are KPSI divided by my shear ultimate, 38.86. That's going to be equal to 1 over my fatigue factor of safety. I solve for that, and I get a fatigue factor of safety of 2.3. This is the approach you would take to work out weld fatigue. Now, keep in mind, I am doing this weld fatigue calculation using weld throat areas from the table, but I am applying it to the base metal. I'm actually not looking in the weld. So what is that doing? The throat area is always going to be less than the leg area of the weld. And so by dividing by the throat area, I'm amplifying the stress, which means I'm making a conservative estimate of the shear stress in the base metal. In fact, I'm overestimating it a bit. And so this fatigue factor of safety ends up being a conservative estimate, not only because I'm using the throat area, but I'm also using the base metal properties. This is a good approach for a problem that is actually quite difficult to sort out.